Welcome to the WWH show. I'm excited to talk about why effective business networking is a lost art and how to remedy this. I'm excited because in this studio, we have Robert Brown Jr. He is by profession a lawyer. He's also the founder of the Writer's Silo and his next book addresses this the same topic. Rob, thank you very much for coming. This is not your first time, so welcome back. Thank you, thank you. It's very good to be back. It's good to see you again. Yeah, this is a very interesting topic for me as a business professional, and I believe that many of our audience are going to learn lots of things. I look forward to our discussion. But the first question we should address is, why should we care about business networking? Which means, what is the significance of business networking? That's a great question. I think specifically um, for business networking, for, for, for business professionals, you know, establishing good partnerships, good strategic alliances amongst business professionals is kind of the engine that drives commerce, whether it be locally, uh, regionally, globally, um, nationally, all those types of things. You know, effective business networking is what really moves things forward. So it's very important for many professionals to have this networking, alliances, partnerships, and so on and so forth. Very much so, very much so, because there are different strengths um, that you can draw uh, from your strategic alliance partners, strengths that they can, can get from you, um, and it's, it's in a lot of ways a very win-win situation. But why do many business professionals engage in networking activities that have little to no impact on building a lens? Uh, that, that's, that's another great question. I think the reason why is because they really don't know better. Um, they, they weren't really trained in effective networking techniques. Um, they're, in a lot of ways, they're comfortable with where they're at. They'll go to networking events and let's say they'll meet 100 people um, and maybe one person will become their client uh, and their strategic alliance partner, They're like, hey, this works. Well, not really. Um, you know, that's the equivalent of just kind of taking stuff and throwing it up against the wall and seeing what sticks. They don't really have a technique. And if they had a, a discernible technique, you know, those hundred people that they met, you know, instead of converting one of them to their client and their strategic alliance partner, they may have been able to convert 10, 15, maybe even 20. The challenge, I think I relate to that because I have attended many professional network events and I don't remember that I succeeded to have business with the majority of the people that I have networked. Of course, right. you know, from these events, I've had great friends, right. partners and alliances, but I could have done better if I knew some of the, techni the techniques of business networking because right. of, as you say, lack of strategy or lack of approach or lack of uh, wise approach toward these partners and alliances, I don't think that I have succeeded in those events that I have attended to, to you know, you know, have uh, clients, customers and so on, but I don't think that I succeeded and I agree that maybe because that was, that was maybe lack of the techniques. What about also uh, knowing the right network place for yourself, right? It could I, be the reason. I, I, that's that's another uh, great point. Um, a lot of people, uh, they'll go to network, they'll hear about a networking event, and boom, they'll automatically go. Um, I used to do that. I, I'll be completely honest yeah, with you. I have been. Yeah, also. exactly. Yeah. But yeah. through trial and error, I learned that not every networking event is for, for me. You, for me, there yeah. are some that are amazing, and there are some yeah. that I'm like, I shouldn't be here. Um, so you really have to kind of discern which are the ones that have the most value for what you're looking to accomplish. Oh, that's, that's a very important point. Another thing we should talk about is why handing our business card is, in, especially in certain situations, are counterproductive because I remember I have hundreds of business cards and right. I go to events, I just give my cards, I meet people, hey, here is my business card. Right. So are there certain situations where maybe handing over our business cards counterintuitive, counterproductive? I think in a lot of situations they are. I think when you have business professionals, uh, specifically let's say at a networking event, when they're giving each other their business cards, 
um, there's almost like a false sense of accomplishment there that, hey, I gave this person my business card and they're going to call me any day now and they're going to give me some clients or they're going to want to be my client. And not necessarily, you know, that could happen. But for me specifically, I've in a lot of ways even abandoned giving out business cards for purposes of a person keeping in in touch with me. In fact, um, I'm currently uh, writing a book that should be available this summer called No Business Cards Allowed. Um, And it basically talks about everything that we're discussing today with regards to networking and when you should give out your business cards and different types of language that you should use. For me, um, I view my business cards as they're kind of sacred to me. I view them as an invitation for a person uh, to sit down with me to talk about whether or not there's a basis for us to do business or we can schedule a conference call. So if I give you my business card, you it's not just a business card. about it's, the relationship. I'm the serious. Friends, yeah. It's an invitation. If you accept my business card, you accept the invitation. And then at that point, we should go ahead, break open our calendars and see when's the best time for us to schedule that meeting or to schedule that conference call to see if, if there's any potential for us to be a resource to each other and, and to move forward. So how, co- how can I make it that kind of decision? For example, I'm in an event or I meet someone, how can I decide that, oh, I should give him or give her my business card? I think through just using bonding and rapport and having a great conversation with someone and, and just telling them, you know, hey, this is, this is the type of work that I do. You know, the type of clients that walk through my door are people who are dealing with this, are dealing with that, having problems with this. Just curious, does any of that kind of resonate with you? Have you dealt with those types of problems? If they say, well, yeah, you know, I, I have dealt with some of those types of things. You know, I'd definitely like to learn a little bit more about, you know, how you can be a resource to me. Great. You know, let me give you my business card. Let's go ahead. Let's set aside a date and a time and a location for us to kind of continue this conversation and, and see if you know I can be a resource to you. So it's through good conversation and good questioning. So first you have to open up for discussion, exchange of ideas, and see whether that person is the right person to have your cards. When should I also refrain from giving my business cards? I would refrain from giving my business card to people, um, basically anything that doesn't fit the definition that I just gave you. Okay. A lot of times when you go to a networking event and people are like, hi, my name is John, and they'll reach out and immediately give you a business card. I'm like, whoa, like, I, don't, <laughs> I don't even know you yet. Let's, let's have a conversation. Okay. Um, and a lot of people will say, well, you know, I'll keep you in mind. Give me your business card. Like, well, you know, I, I appreciate that you keep me in mind. But, you know, once again, my business cards are sacred to me. I only okay. give them out when a person wants to schedule a, either a meeting with me or a conference call. You know, if the person's like, well, how can I get a hold of you? Great. There's a great tool for that. It's called LinkedIn. Let's let's get connected on LinkedIn and has all my contact information there. And, you know, through social media, we, we can keep in touch that way. That means you put your business cards above, for example, uh, on those other network devices like, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook right. and so on. People, if they want to get in touch with you to see what you're doing and keep up with you, they can join your LinkedIn, your Facebook, Twitter and so Absolutely. on. Absolutely. But if they are serious about doing business with you, that's when they should ask you the business card. Exactly. Exactly. And it lends your business card a certain air of prestige. Like not everybody gets my business card. You know, only the people, I mean, it's a business card. If you don't want to do business or at least consider doing business with me, why do you want my business card? You know, if you, well, I just want to keep in touch with you. Great. Let's, let's get connected on LinkedIn and keep in touch that way. Now, some people, you know, even people who are watching us, they may not be interested in going to business events for the purpose of networking. Which business professionals do you think frequent in business networks? The, the ones that frequently go to business networks? Well, mostly it's business development professionals that are looking for clients either for themselves, for their own practice, or for the company that they're working for. Um, and normally there are three types of professionals that I've noticed um, that go to those type of events, that attend those type of events. The first is, I call them the posers. Uh, these are people that are there. They got a great smile. Posers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they got a great smile. They got their business cards ready. They're kind of like the life of the party. 
Um, but in a lot of in a lot of respects, they're not there for business. They're more uh, there for so socializing, just watching, observing, yeah, just watching, observing, and having just, fun, maybe. Yeah, yeah, you know. And those I call those the posers. There are also people that that kind of fall into that category. Um, they're they're somewhat unenthusiastic about being there. Um, maybe their supervisor that was told them, drawn, yeah. yeah, they're like, I want you to go to this networking <laughs> event. And I want you to get ten business cards. They're there without their willingness. Yeah, or, yeah, they're just there the just yeah. for whatever reason yeah. to be there. Like, hey, there's an open bar, or there's some free hors d'oeuvres there, uh, you know, or maybe some, you know, free trinkets uh, at the door. Let me go there and just kind of get some freebies, and then I'll be out. Um, and then the second group of, of professionals that I notice go to these types of networking events, I call them the cowboys. Um, the cowboys. And the, the cowboys. Oh, and okay. the reason why is because the first time they meet you, you know, they whip out their business card <laughs> almost like it's a six gun in there in the old yeah. west. I mean, they're quick to give you their business card, and you know, you barely said like two words. I would avoid uh, doing them. that yeah, in the future. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I call those uh, the the cowboys. The last category, and this is the category that you know I like that, that okay. I'm I'm familiar with that I like to consider myself is the processed focused professionals. These are people that are there to have great conversations, that are there to make new contacts, but they have a plan, they have a strategy, they have different tactics, they have language that they want to use because they want to see you know, who is going to be a great potential client for them or a great potential strategic alliance partner. So they kind of come in with a game plan. So it's not only for the people who are there, like you say, the three group, the three groups, for example, myself, if I go to an event, I should be able to find out who are the posers, who are the cowboys, and who are serious about networking. So I have to find the third group and mingle with them and use my time to interact with this kind of people. Right. So and understanding these three types of business professionals is very important for us to succeed in creating alliances. Right, exactly. And, and the only way you can do that um, is just to have conversations with these professionals and, you know, first two to three minutes of talking to somebody, you can kind of tell, you know, which category they fall in and then you can kind of make the decision from there, you know, is this person a poser, is this person a cowboy or, you know, is this person a process focused professional that, you know, there can possibly be a, a basis for us to, you know, move forward, whether or not I'm going to be their client, they're going to be my client or we're going to be strategic alliance partners and be a resource to each other and supporting each other's business. Once we are there, you know, if we decide to go and network and create alliances, what kind of things business professionals should make sure to do to create quality strategic alliances? That's a great question. I think um, one of the things that they need to do is when you're creating a strategic alliance with someone, you want to make sure that if you set a meeting, um, they, that you have a definable agenda for that meeting. Um, I can't tell you how many meetings that I've been to, how much time I have wasted in my professional career um, meeting with people and saying, hey, let's just grab some coffee. Well, okay, great. And no I specific agenda. No agenda, no nothing. No goal, nothing. Yeah, and I'm thinking, hey, this person will be a great client for me. But they're probably thinking, hey, I'm just going to catch up with Rob and have coffee and we'll talk about, you know, the, the, the basketball game from last night. Yeah. You know, I and, so many people with right. the same kind of expectations. Let me hang out with him. I hang out with that person, but nothing comes out of that, you know, hang out, whether a strategic partnership or whether I serving him or he serving me. So we lost the moment. We lost our time. Right. Exactly. You know, and. I think that um, specifically here in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, um, and for the world for that matter, um, you know, money isn't necessarily the most important currency. I have a colleague that likes to say that, you know, time is the most important currency. I agree with that, yeah. Yeah, if, if you lose money, you can get it back. You can get, it, can back. get it back, yeah. If you lose time, it's gone forever. Yeah. Um, so I, I even say that, you know, if you lose your health, you can you may get it back. If you lose, you lose you know, your relationships, you may get them back. But if you lose your time, there is no way. If it's gone. It's gone, it's gone. It's gone. That's why. I regret I, for those moments that I, mo I, I, I lost. Right. You, you regret that. Um, and, and the way to kind of make up for those regrets is to make sure that, you know, when you're meeting someone, you're asking them the right questions, you know, you're having meaningful dialogue with them to see, is this person I should invest my time with? Because not everybody is someone that you should invest your time with. Um, and it's better for you to at least find that out up front as opposed to 
three, four, five, six months down the road and be yeah. like, that was six months wasted. So that's why you want to find out as early as you can, should, should I spend time with this person or is this wash my hands, kind of shake hands, part as friends and go about the other opportunity? So what kind of things I should use? For example, I just met someone. And now I have to decide whether I should spend my time, my energy, my resources on that person to create alliances. What kind of things I should do? I'm, I'm just thinking because you are right. you know, the expert on this thing. You are writing, researching on this thing. You are um, developing content. So you may help me. So if I have someone to decide for me to say whether this person is going to be a strategic partner for me, maybe I should go and uh, see his profile. Uh, you know, at LinkedIn, maybe Facebook. Uh, let me see what kind of Twitter message that person sends and evaluate what kind of priorities that person has. What is the brand of that person? If this person adds something to what I do, can I add something to that person? Is there any need that I can meet for him or her? The right. same way, is there any need or any uh, thing that I want from this person. So I have to be clear before I even take the first step to invite, to invite that person to be my strategic partner. Exactly, exactly. You, you have to kind of do a self-assessment first and say, first of all, what is, if I could, if I could paint a, a perfect picture of, of what my ideal client looks like, what, is that per what does that person look like on paper? And you, you, you have that, you set that aside and say, okay, if I could paint a perfect picture of what my ideal strategic partner looks like, what do they look like on paper? And then once you know specifically what you're looking for, then you're already ahead of the game because you can kind of weed out the people that don't really fit in either of those two categories. And when you're talking to um, a potential strategic alliance partner, let's say for whatever reason, let's just say you're looking to form alliances with uh, um, CPAs certified public accountants and you're looking to form alliances with them but you notice that the types of CPAs that you're looking to work with have been in business for at least 10 years. You have your criteria there. You know what you're looking for. So if you go to a networking event and a person says, hey, you know, my name is Susie Smith. I'm, you know, a real estate agent. That's not the type of person that you're, you're looking, looking Nothing wrong with being a real estate agent, but that's not the type of professional yeah. that you're looking to make a strategic alliance with. You're looking for CPAs. Now, the next person that you meet or two or three people down the road you meet, you meet a CPA and you talk to them. And, you know, they've just gotten their credentials, finished their CPA exams, and they've only been in business for about two to three years. Probably not the best fit for you. Now, that person may have potential, you may want to get connected with them on LinkedIn, and you may even set a meeting with them, may even exchange business cards with them, but they're not your ideal strategic alliance partner. So you really want to go into these events knowing specifically what you're looking for. You want to inject as much precision and predictability in these type of networking events as you should possibly do, once again, to protect your time into the protective time of the people that you're working with. Because you don't want to waste your time, but you don't want to waste theirs also either. Also, their, their, their time too. And right. you should find ways to really uh, find those people, those uh, professional business people that are very important in, you know, in your priorities. Exactly. The things that you'd like to do. We talked about what to do, but what about what we should not do? What you should not do. Yeah, we should not do because, yes, we should do this and that to create strategic alliances. But we should also consider what we should not do so that we may avoid right. you know, counterproductive uh, alliances. Um, I think a couple things that you can do, and I, I discuss um, all this in, in the book, No Business Cards Allowed. But um, one of the things that you can do is, you know, stop doing is, once again, giving out your business cards for purposes of people staying in touch with you. You can do that through LinkedIn. You can do that through other means. Um, another thing that you shouldn't do is you shouldn't move forward um, in a relationship. And this kind of goes across the board, whether or not it's a strategic partnership, whether it's a, a client professional relationship, whether or not it's a personal relationship. Always make sure in the beginning that before you move forward with that person, you establish a good communication protocol. Never move forward without establishing a good communication protocol. And what I mean by that is, let's say you and I meet at a networking event and 
um, potentially, you know, there's, you know, some synergy there. There may be a basis for us to do business. Um, and I do give you my business card um, and you give me your business card um, and I have your contact information. You have my contact information and things look well. Well, you might be an email person. OK, I may be a phone person. So if I call you and I don't get a hold of you and you never answer your phone, then I'm going to be like, like, oh, he's not. Interested. This guy's not interested. You are interested. You're just not a phone person. You're an email person. Some people are text messages. Some people are Facebook. You really have to establish a good communication protocol at the very outset of any potential strategic alliance partnerships that you build so that you all are what I like to call operating from the same set of facts. I want to make sure like, you know, how often do you want me to call you? How often do you want me to email you? Like when's the best time for us to chat on the phone? When's the best time for us to set meetings with each other? You want to make sure that you, you never move forward without establishing a good communication protocol up front. I think it's very important because in my own life, I have organizations, I attract people into the board of directors, advisors, and so on. Sometimes I think that, okay, if I email to someone, my understanding is that I open my emails whenever I am available, when I have spare time. So whatever email you send me, I'm not irritated because I open it whenever I am available. Exactly. But if you text me, it's a little bit irritating if I'm busy, for example, or if, mm. if you call me without asking me, not, um, I'm just giving you an example. So sometimes it's very hard for me to, uh, I send email, somebody may not respond to me, I don't know why, when I call to them, they pick the phone. Hey, for me, it's the email that's, that right. I prefer. <laughs> right. The phone is the one which is urgent and I don't want someone to call me, for example, at this moment because I'm engaged with you. I want focus. But for other people, you know, for some other people, maybe they prefer telephone rather than email. I text some people. They don't respond. Right. They, they don't respond. But when I call, they pick. When I email, they pick. Right. So knowing which media they prefer. Is very important, and also putting you know you know in place those rules. Exactly, is very important because there would be misunderstandings, and that misunderstanding may lead to maybe resentment, disagreement, you know, and so on and so forth. It's better first to make sure that which media we should use, how frequently we should contact, and so on. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But it takes time and energy and discipline to make sure that because always we want to communicate with other people based on our own preferences. For me, I always prefer email first, maybe right. text, and then phone. Because, you know, I'm a person who would like to sit down, reflect, think, write. I'm an author, a trainer, so I want to reflect and so on. I prefer if I get email than phone call, because phone calls should be like when we have agenda to talk. Or right. if it's very urgent, I will pick a, a, a phone and call. And I expect somebody to call me when it is urgent. But if, if it's not urgent, I prefer someone to send me email as a heads up so that I will think about it. I'll prepare myself. When we talk next time through phone, it would be, for me, I would be ready and it would be great. Right. But f for other people, it may be the reverse. Mm -hmm. they, may, they may be extroverts. Mm -hmm. They don't want to really spend time on the email. You know, one paragraph email, they're not interested to get that. They right. just prefer you. Just call them. Right. Exactly. Make it spontaneous. And, and exactly. And you have your specific communication protocol that works for you, and, and that's great. Yes. The problem that most business professionals have is, is not having the communication protocol, is not conveying that to the other person so that you all are, once again, aren't operating from the same set of facts. So it's always important to establish that up front and say, hey, you know what? I do emails first, and then I do this, and then, and then we kind of graduate to phone calls. That's the way I operate, you know? And when the other person understands that, then they can kind of adjust accordingly. Like, hey, I'm kind of like that too, you know? You know, I have a friend. I respect him. I send him, I send him email. He may not respond to for days, maybe sometimes for weeks. Right. Text him. He may not respond. I call him even difficult, during difficult times. He picks it. So for me, like, okay, this, I don't want to judge him. If, if, you know, if he doesn't respond to my emails, my texts, doesn't mean that he's disregarding me. Mm -hmm. But he's a phone person. So I have to know him so that if I have something, you know, very urgent, especially, I pick the phone and call him directly. Right. Exactly. So this is very important. 
So how can we, because that means now networking, professional networking is very important for our success. Mm -hmm. And we have to develop this skill of networking. So what are some of the skills we should develop? I think, you know, through developing your skills, um, it's kind of like everything else, practice. Go to many networking events at the outset. If, you, if you're like, I'm not that confident a networker, I need to get out there and kind of do more networking and I need to kind of build my skills up. The first thing I do is just practice, practice, practice. Go out always. Go out. You can't just memorize and picture how you can network. Whatever you plan to do, go there and do it and learn from the experience. Exactly. And when you go there, um, you want to... Uh, set activity goals and what I mean by that is don't just go to a networking event and just say hey I'm just gonna go here and I'm just gonna walk around and, and, and talk to people and then I'm gonna walk out and I hope I survive it no you want to go in and say okay my goal is my activity goal for this particular networking event is I want to talk to 15 people tonight I want to have 15 good conversations now you, you don't necessarily want to say I want to you know get three strategic alliances from tonight, because you can't really control who you're going to meet with regards to whether or not they're going to be a good strategic alliance for you. You don't really know who you're going to meet. But you can control how many people you approach. So you can say, my activity goal tonight is to approach and have conversations with 15 people. Three to four minutes per person. That's between, I guess, what, what 40, around 45 minutes. It's about That's about right. You know, you can go and walk up to someone and you introduce yourself and you know shake their hand and learn a little bit about them and they can learn a little bit about you and and then you can kind of see like is this a person that I would like to give my business card because there is some potential for us to do business so you can kind of set activity goals with regards to you know developing your skill set and being a better networker um, with regards to social media um, I would advise uh, all business professionals and people who want to do more networking make sure you have a, a really comprehensive um, good tight LinkedIn page. Um, I think that LinkedIn is a highly underutilized um, tool for networking, for business prospecting. You want to make sure you have a really um, good picture of yourself. Um, you can even go to a professional photo studio and get a professional photo. Um, you know, make sure that you kind of in your net in in your LinkedIn profile you talk about what you do, what you're looking for, the best way to get a hold of you. Once again, you can establish the communication protocol through your LinkedIn. Say the best way to get a hold of me is to email me at John Jones or whatever at whatever.com. Your email address. My best the best way to get a hold of me is to call me. You know, 703-555-1212. You know, give people your phone number. You know, make it very easy for a person to see exactly, you know, who you are and what you're looking to accomplish and how to get a hold of you if they should decide in their own way, hey, I'd like to meet this person. There may be some potential for us to do business. So make sure one of the skills you want to do is make sure that you kind of get adept in using LinkedIn and just you know presenting a very professional demeanor on LinkedIn. So should we only use LinkedIn or do you recommend other social media? You can use other social media um, depending on the nature of your business, uh, what type of, of industry that you're in. Um, there are you know, lots of, of social media um, tools that you can use, Facebook, Pinterest, uh, Twitter accounts. There are a lot of people um, using a variety of different methods. Um, but for me personally, you know, I have the most experience on LinkedIn, so I can kind of speak more authoritatively on LinkedIn than the others. But I mean, they're all equally good, once again, depending on what you're looking to accomplish and what industry you're in. I think I agree with that because, for example, if you have pictures, products, and so on, pin interest, you know, it could be a, a great exactly. place to post, you know, your products and so on. If you are a person who would like to share your events, the photos, videos, and so on, you may use Facebook. Facebook, exactly. If you are sending some quotes, because if you are a teacher, educator, motivator, and so on, maybe use Twitter, send, you know, short messages of motivation. Through Twitter, yes, yeah, things Twitter, like that, exactly, yeah. LinkedIn is, I, however, is the most popular social media that people, especially recruiters, business owners and so on, they exactly. go there to see your profile and see what kind of, but still it requires us to invest some time to know how to create our page. I always struggle, you know, of course I always improve my page, 
But the, the, the challenge is you have so many things to do. You work for so many clients. You have so many products and services. How can you use LinkedIn to be focused and use that to attract the clients that you're looking for? So we need to increase our knowledge and the skill about using social media. Absolutely. So that we'll be successful in our networking because these days on top of going in person, and network with people and creating alliances, we should also be able to use online virtual media platforms. Exactly. Like you know, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and there are a lot of uh, professionals um, kind of in the area that specialize in training business professionals uh, specifically on using social media. Um, I have a, a good friend, Johannes Watts, um, and he owns a company called Learn to Link, um, and he specifically trains business professionals on you know not only the functionality of the LinkedIn, the buttons that you push, but language and techniques and strategies for you know prospecting and reaching out and making new strategic alliances. And I, I took one of his courses about two years ago. It was absolutely phenomenal. So there are a lot of professionals out there that specifically will teach you how to use social media um, to kind of foster and build those types of strategic alliance relationships. Uh, we have been talking about you know the 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 uh, mindset we should have and also the skills we should develop and so on what about the um the decision we should make for example how business professionals gouge or measure whether a networking group is right for them or not because right. we should not just go there and interact or join every group that uh, we may find on our way right well, um, as you know, in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, there's no shortage um, of networking okay. events and networking groups uh, in the area. Um, I imagine it's like that in a lot of major metropolitan uh, areas, not only in the United States, but worldwide. Um, I think it's important as you're considering whether or not you want to join a, a specific networking group, um, you want to really take time to visit them. Um, there are a lot of networking groups that will allow you to visit um, whether... Without being a member. Or without, without being a member. Without paying any fee. Exactly. They'll, they'll let you visit. Some, some um, networking events, uh, excuse me, networking groups will let you come. They'll have like networking breakfasts. A lot of them meet really early in the morning. Um, you know, they'll have their members like invite you and say, hey, why don't you come out um, to, to our, our networking uh, group and you can learn a little bit about us. You know, see if it's a good fit for you, if, if maybe this kind of fits in what you're looking to accomplish and how you're going to build up your business. Um, I would definitely invest time in visiting those groups. And when you're there, make sure you not only meet um, as many people who are members of that group as possible, but, you know, if you can, Take the president aside, take the vice president of that group aside, have a conversation with them. You know, really learn about that group's strategic goals, their vision, what the group is looking to accomplish, how the resources that they provide for their members. Um, and then talk to the members, you know, whether or not they just joined a month ago or they've been a member of that group for three to four years. And just ask them, you know, you know, how has your business changed ever since you joined this networking group? You know, has it increased dramatically was it you know kind of you know, gradual like how did joining this networking group you know put more clients um into your pipeline and and ultimately more dollars into your pocket or the pocket of the business that you're either working for um or the business that you own so i'm um, asking once again asking great questions um you know visiting these networking groups um, and, you know, you can always Google and, and do online research about networking groups and seeing what their reputation is, both nationally, regionally, and, and locally in that, in that particular area. Um, and you can get a lot out of that. I should, I should have done that. You know, when I was trying to network and go and see network groups mm -hmm. in, the, in, I think, in 2011, 12, I used to frequently go to networking events and trying to join some of the, the networking groups. The problem was I didn't do this, you know, uh, these things. Right. I didn't do my homework. Right. I just joined them, and, but it was frustrating because, some, for example, in one group, the majority of the members were uh, startup businesses and retail businesses, you, right. know, you know, and they come there with their products. The, they, these products are not important to me right. you know, at that moment. And at the same time, when I talk to them about my services, 
these are trainings, workshops, consulting, and so on. They look at me and they wonder why, you know, I think about, you know, this service is relevant to them because right. they are just one individual producing some products. So why should they need really training or workshops because they don't have members? Mm -hmm. So I didn't know at that time I should have studied these kind of things. I should have talked to the presidents, the decision makers, see what kind of people are coming here, what kind of needs they have. So if I knew that my services are not needed by that group, I shouldn't really uh, gone there. I shouldn't have wasted right. their time or, and also my time. So it's very important, as you said, first to study, uh, know the group, what kind of people are coming, what kind of needs they have, whether your products and services are relevant to that group. So you exactly. shouldn't just go there and join network groups. Exactly. And there's another thing that that's a great point. That's kind of a segue to the point I want to make now is that a lot of the networking groups, and you have to be really careful about this, a lot of them are just kind of out and out based on membership. They just want to increase their membership. They want tons of people sending them fees and they could really care less what happens after that. You have to be careful of those networking groups because a lot of times what you'll do is you will go to the networking group and you'll meet some people, you'll shake some hands, you're like, hey, I'm going to join this group. And you join the group and you find out that there are five, six, seven people in that group that all that do what you do so technically they're your competitor and every they've been in there for a couple months maybe a couple of years and people are giving those professionals referrals what chance do you stand as like a new member of the group whereas that particular niche or that particular industry is already represented by five six seven professionals already they won't tell you that at the outset because they're just thinking about upping Adding their membership people, getting and getting more, more fees yeah you know, I particularly I was uh, I was invited to um, a networking group. Uh, I will leave the the name um, mm. uh, anonymous for now, but it is a, a networking group where they're kind of all around the region and they meet really early in the morning. And the way the networking group is structured is they have one of each industry, or they have a lot of different industries um, represented there. You'll have a mortgage broker, you'll have a CPA, a real estate agent, you'll have a variety of different industries represented there um, and they basically trade referrals and things of that nature um, and they meet weekly and a lot of times they'll meet really early in the morning. Well, I met um, uh, a business professional at a networking event and she was like, hey, you know, why don't you come to my networking group? Um, I'd love to have you there. So I'm thinking, great, you know, I'll come out and, you know, she told me it was way out in, in, in Virginia um, and I went there and visited. And uh, I didn't know as a guest, I thought being a guest, I was a true guest, but I had to actually pay for my own breakfast. I'm like, well, wow. that's strange. I'm a guest, but I have to pay. I was like, okay, well, that's, if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. So um, as I'm talking to people there and I was kind of told them what I do, they already had somebody um, there that did what I do. So, you know, I left walking away thinking, what was the point of me being there as a guest when really I had no chance of ever joining this group, even if I decide this is a great group for me because they already had somebody there that does what I do. So you really have to be careful when people, quote unquote, invite you to be a guest at their, their networking group they're a member of. You always want to ask, well, that, that sounds great. Tell me a little bit more about your group. You know, you know I'm a, a real estate agent. You know, do you have people in your group who are already real estate agents that kind of do what I do, that people are already sending, you know, them referrals. If they say, well, yeah, we got two to three, you know, real estate agents in our group, then you kind of want to ask, well, that begs the question, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that you want me to, 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 to join uh, your group or to be a guest there, but, you know, what, what's kind of in it for me? Like, why would I be there, you know, and just kind of sit and, and see, you know, what their response is. And, you know, they may have some sort of quota to meet. Like, I need to yeah. bring in five, six, seven guests um, a month. And, you know, if, if that's the quota that they have, then that's fine. But you want to find out and learn about that up front so that you can make a wise strategic business decision as to whether or not it's even worth your time to go there. Once yeah. again, protecting yeah. your time. Yeah, yeah. This is great stuff. I enjoyed our discussion, Rob. And I look forward to reading your book. I cannot wait to read it.
Absolutely. It's, it's called uh, No Business Cards Allowed, um, and I'm going to put it on the other website that I'm developing for bookloversonly.com. It's going to be uh, available sometime this summer. I'm shooting for a July 2015 release. So That would be great. On behalf of Isat and our viewers, thank you very much for coming, and I enjoyed our discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks, I appreciate thanks, it. Rob. Yeah. Our viewers, this is my hope that you have learned so many stuff. You are a professional. You need to go out hang out with people, join networking events, because you can't succeed by sitting alone. You have to go out, network, but you have to make sure that you develop the skills, the mindsets, and also you have to make sure that you study the network groups that you'd like to join. So don't just go there and attend every event. Don't waste your time, energy, and resources. Make sure that you join the right networking events and groups. Until I see you next time, have a wonderful time. Thank you very much for watching.